Welcome to Art for All, the Sketchbook School podcast. I'm your host, Danny Gregory. Each week, I bring you stories, ideas, interviews, and inspiration to keep you company while you work on your own creative project, whether you're painting or writing or composing or cooking dinner. I hope this episode inspires you. That's our mission at Sketchbook School, to help encourage art for all. This week, we're going to talk about how to turn your passion into a full-time job. What's involved in making a living as a creative person? How do you make ends meet while doing what you love? Let's ask some experts, the faculty of Sketchbook School. When I was a senior in high school, thinking about my future, I was quick to dismiss the idea of becoming an artist. It seemed so hard to make a living. In most any other kind of career, there seemed to be a clear track I could follow, get a degree, use that degree to get an entry-level job in a company, and slowly work my way up the ranks. If I wanted to be a writer, I could start as a cub reporter, like Jimmy Olsen in Superman comics. If I wanted to be a, in business, I could start in the mailroom. If I wanted to be a doctor, I could start as a resident. But I had no idea how you started out as an artist or an illustrator. It seemed such a huge leap. Artists had their work in galleries and museums, and they sold for zillions of dollars. I had no idea what you did to get there. It just seemed like some sort of magical process cloaked in mystery. Making a living and being an adult seemed daunting enough. So I decided I would just take myself down one of the broad, clearly marked avenues that were indicated with flashing signs. Economics major leads to business school or Wall Street. History or poli-sci major leads to law school or journalism. English major leads to publishing or something. With no role models to tell me otherwise, I trudged toward these well-lit glide paths. In retrospect, things might have been easier if I had gone to art school, but I'm not so sure. My son went to the best art school in the country, but he didn't graduate knowing exactly how to proceed to become a self-supporting fine artist. Art school didn't spend much time teaching him about real life, about how to enter the industry to earn a living. In the end, he found his way to making a creative living, but it's only tangential to making fine art. That seems to be the way with so many who set out to be full-time artists. Is it just a filtering process that takes all those high school kids who like to draw and figures more and more ways to cull the herd, cutting it back until there are just a small handful left to actually get into the galleries? The rest diverted into teaching middle school art or working as designers in banks or painting an occasional painting on occasional weekends or just hanging up their pens and brushes once and for all? Is it a giant obstacle course or have I missed how it really works? How do artists actually make a living? Not the top 0.1% who marry supermodels and are represented by the Uber galleries, but the majority of creative people who are able to commit to making art and still manage to feed their families. How do artists make a living? To find out, I talk to the people I know who are doing it, the teachers of Sketchbook School. Most of them are full-time artists who've figured this problem out. They're all terrific artists, of course, who've put lots of effort into refining their skills. But they're also good enough at being independent business people to put bread on the table. So I called up a few of my pals, and I asked if they'd be willing to share how they do it. The first thing I discovered shouldn't have been a surprise. They are very creative in their approach to filling their wallets and their days. Here's British illustrator Onmar Wynn on all the ways she applies her talents to make ends meet. I sell images on various image libraries, or little doodads, I call them. I teach workshops. I teach online. I sell designs for products like greetings cards, giftware, stationery, fabric. I also have an Etsy shop, and I am about to start self-publishing. <laughs> In Manchester, England, Andrea Joseph also supports herself by making art, but she's woven together her own creative way of doing it. I uh, do book illustration or some editorial. I organize really fab drawing events. I teach workshops. I work for various charities who use artists in prison, in the judicial system, working with people whose lives are in chaos. And I love that work. I sell my own work, make drawings that 
hopefully will sell. There are just so many different aspects to it, which is scary at some points, but it also really keeps things very interesting too. I called up Matthias Adolfsson in Sweden. Matthias started his career as an architect, then went into video game design. Two career paths that had him working for big companies that could provide him with a regular paycheck and benefits. But then he decided he just had to dedicate himself to making art full time and walked away to create his own business as an illustrator. About uh, half of my income comes from uh, my books and uh, me selling uh, original work. Uh, I have a French firm that I work together with called Atelier, Atelier Chou. Uh, who make baby blankets and now baby uh, clothing. And then the rest is uh, commission work, uh, all kinds of stuff like American magazines and uh, uh, work more or less all over the world stuff with the animation industry also for movies or television shows. So it's a, it's a strange mix. I'm surprised that it's possible to... Uh, to do the stuff I do. I didn't even think that it could work being an illustrator. I think it's all part of the, the internet thing, that it's possible to to work all over the world, uh, even though you're sitting in a small little unimportant country in, in Europe. There's a myth that artists can't be good business people. But the fact is, handling all of these streams of income means you have to develop the skills of an entrepreneur to make sure that you're getting paid, that you're paying your bills and taxes, and that you're serving your clients and your customers and your collectors. Here's Andrea again. Obviously, because uh, we love illustration and drawing, and it's the best business in the world, but being a creative freelancer is really, really hard. Next, let's go to Atlanta, Georgia, and talk to Mike Lowry. He's a successful children's book illustrator, but managing that success is serious business. Yeah, business is a big part of it. There's certain weeks where all I get to do is illustration, and that's absolutely, of course, my favorite part of the job. But then there's certain days where I sit down and just have to respond to a bunch of emails. Compare it to running a small business. I mean, making the art, some days and some weeks can can be almost non-existent. I mean, you're dealing with emails, responding, coming up with quotes. You have to remember to actually get in touch with people who you've done work for to make sure that you're getting paid. It's really our weakest point, probably, is the business business side. We kind of manage, but on occasion it can be a bit, uh, a lot of stuff. It's a bit chaotic. Uh, Paper tend to uh, pile up. We think of ourselves as artists, and that being creative and imaginative is somehow antithetical to the sort of rational thinking that business people do. But of course, as artists, we make practical decisions all the time. We have to learn skills. We have to figure out tools. We have to network. We have to be efficient. We have to solve problems. And we have to work really hard. Artists may be dreamers sometimes, but we can train ourselves to be hard-nosed and organize too. I have discovered ways around challenges of being in the business of illustration. So my timetable on a Monday often involves the admin side of things, which can't be underestimated. I've just finished this year's uh, accounts for my tax returns. Also emails to clients, making sure that I'm going to have stock for my Etsy shop and looking at uh, different suppliers and checking on my various student projects. I'm also looking into doing in-person workshops. Um, I'm trying to find the space for that and I'm liaising with suppliers who want to supply art materials for my workshops. It, I, <laughs> there's so much actually to consider and that's just a typical Monday. <laughs> if I just accept physical artwork isn't going to get done on Monday, I'm much happier throughout the rest of the week. Um, there's a phrase called eat the frog. Do the thing that you may loathe the most, get it over and done with, and then you know it's done, which means I've got the rest of the week 
uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to enjoy, let's say, the more creative side of things. Just write down a checklist of what I need to accomplish in the next day. It's written on the back of an envelope. And it's so satisfying to cross things off as I do them. So I'm looking at this now and it's like, oh, I've forgotten to do that. So I try and be organized. And if something doesn't get resolved today, I usually factor in a good uh, time scale so that I'll meet a certain deadline anyhow. So I don't stress out too much about it. Entrepreneurs who work as one person teams are called solopreneurs. And if you've ever worked alone from home, you know how it can start to be a lonely grind sitting at your desk in your pajamas. It's vital to stay connected to the world and not just get lost in your work. In the beginning, it was like oh, suddenly I was on holiday. I'd given up work and here I was. I was an illustrator and yet yeah, I was at home and I wasn't seeing people and I wasn't speaking to people like you would in work. It, You wake up in the morning saying, oh, what day is it? Who am I? What am I supposed to do today? I'm working at home alone. (laughs) And it it drove me a bit mad. (laughs) You need something to get out of your pyjamas for. (laughs) Because there's nothing more depressing than finding you're still in your pyjamas at lunchtime. (laughs) Because you don't have to leave the house, so why change? (laughs) If anyone rung or messaged me and said, do you fancy a coffee? I'd be, yes, yes. And I found myself going out urban sketching all the time and then realising, actually, this isn't making me any money. And, you know, despite the fact that it's great and I want to be drawing, I still have to to bring some money in. I still have to make a living. Um, My friend has an art cafe. And so I do go and I work there a couple of days a week because I just needed to get out of the house (laughs) and not be on my own all the time and speak to people and see people. But also what it gave me was a structure. You need to build those kind of healthy practices and things into into the, your day. When I was a creative director in advertising, my team and I hired a lot of great illustrators, but we never called them directly. We'd speak to their agents or their representatives, and they would send us over portfolios to pick who we wanted to work with. All of our communications went through these intermediaries, so I just assumed that this was still how my artist friends got assignments. I imagined that they sat in their gorgeous studios, the phone would ring, and their agents would drop another plum assignments in their lap. I was wrong. So for about a decade, I worked with an agent. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about agents and what they can bring to this partnership of you working with somebody else. But the strength that they had was that they would manage taking care of contracts, making sure that I got paid and then sending me a a check so that I didn't have to really deal with that. And then when I would get an email from a client, I could just forward it to them and say, all right, take over. And so then I could really focus on making art. I have had reps in the past. I decided that I was better without a rep. So I handle everything myself. Part of me says, oh, you are such a control freak. But part of me says it it actually, I have to play it this way in order to do what I want to do. And the reasons why it didn't work out with various agents was I am quite determined and tenacious. I want to do what I want to do. And if their vision and my vision didn't match, then it wasn't going to work. Because I have big visions. I have a Swedish agent. I don't get the the commissions from the agent. They contact me first and then I channel it through the agent uh, later on to take care of uh, those uh, dreadful uh, questions about fees and stuff like that. Initially, I thought that an illustrator had to have an agent to be working on children's books. And I got my first children's book project as an illustrator on my own by sending out postcards and that sort of thing. And then I took that to my agent when I got them and said, here's this thing that I just started. You take over and 
handle the negotiation stuff. So that turned out to be something that was misinformed. You don't have to have an agent to be working as a children's illustrator. And in some ways it can be better not to have one. And I'm making a point of saying that because I think that a lot of people who don't have agents think that an agent's job is to bring you more work, which can happen, but it's also really up to the illustrator to you know be pushing their, their work and getting their stuff out there as well. Here's Lapin, who is French and lives in Barcelona. Like my other friends, he finds that an agent is only part of the story. He has to work hard to promote himself and his work to make sure that the assignments keep flowing. First agent represented me about 11, 12 years ago in Paris. But actually, I think it's now quite easy to, to make it on your own. Thanks to the social media, nowadays uh, I've got many clients contacting me directly through Instagram and Facebook. And I send a newsletter to, to the people who subscribe on my web. So uh, it also helps clients and and your followers to, to understand better what you're doing. I think it's interesting to, to work with uh, social media. Instagram, I, I really enjoy it, but it's also it's necessary to get aside a, a real portfolio website to show more clearly what you're doing and uh, all the projects you can manage. Onmar also used various social media platforms and other tools to get her work out there. It's a long-term investment that can take years to bear fruit. I have been very fortunate that I was mindful to upload my illustrations to Pinterest. I'm very fortunate that I don't have to reach out to any clients. They find me through Pinterest or my website or uh, Instagram. The art licensing show that I went to in May of this year, I, I thoroughly enjoyed attending that, but it is an incredible amount of preparation and effort and something like that is an incredibly long-term investment we're talking years and years of being seen at these shows what is it like to be successful at art to have security and confidence in your career i'll discuss that right after this short break Sketchbook School is an online art school, but it's actually a lot more than that. For tens of thousands of creative people around the world, Sketchbook School is a chance to start being creative again, to learn to draw and paint, but also to overcome the blocks and obstacles that have held them back creatively. Besides classes and workshops, Sketchbook School is also a huge community of creative people, people like you who want to be inspired and get back to the pure joy of creativity that they once had as children. It's a wonderful place, and I'm so lucky to be part of it. If you like inspiration like this podcast, sign up for the Sketchbook School zine. It's full of ideas, recommendations, tips, and stories. It's very valuable, but it's also free. To get yours delivered to your email every other week, just go to sketchbook.school and sign up for your own subscription. Just look in the menu under free stuff. Now, back to the show. What is the line between expressing yourself and doing what you have to do to make a buck and get assignments? Lapin has a very strong and recognizable style in his sketchbook. For some clients, that's exactly what they want. But what if they want something else from you? How willing should you be to compromise? That's what I, I did as a, as a beginner uh, freelancer to, to adapt myself to the commission. But yeah, actually, I was not very happy with the result and the client neither. And he was giving me some references of uh, some already well-known illustrator. But uh, they, were, they do not have enough budget, for example, to, to commission them directly. And yeah, I, I decided to not uh, process this way anymore. I know, it's hard to imagine discovering a great artist like Lapin and then asking him to just copy some other person's style and to do it for less. But there are hacks all over, and there's always someone willing to do things for cheap. The key is to remember why you are doing this, why you decided to embark on this path of committing to art. It's because you need to make the work that's burning inside of you. There are things you may be willing to do to keep the lights on, but if you stray too far down that path, you're undermining 
the whole mission, the whole reason that you went out on your own in the first place. That doesn't mean just cranking out the same thing, however. You don't have to just be the donut maker. Creative people take risks and go in new directions all the time. I got a new kind of commission work. Can I do this? Well, why not? And I, I do it and I get some more money to uh, be able to uh, do my personal stuff. The end plan is kind of always to just work as a, with my personal drawing because I, that's the thing I really love. Working as a freelancer of any kind can be a wonderful source of freedom. But with freedom comes responsibility. No matter how well things are going, there are no guarantees that the work will continue to flow your way. That anxiety hangs over every freelancer's head. What if the work dries up forever? Here's Mike Lowry. Over the years, I've worked with a lot of publishers doing illustration for other people's manuscripts. And it, it put me into a good spot where then, as I'm kind of wrapping something up, something else kind of pops up. It is my personality to assume that that will not happen again, ever again, you know? And I, I keep trying to kind of pad what will be happening. And so I, I just pitched a project that got picked up that will last for at least the next two years, hopefully three. But even with that in mind, I'm already thinking about like, okay, what else can I be doing while this project is going on to make sure that I have more work later, right? These kids of mine, they just, they want to eat uh, every day. And that is, you know, it adds up. The answer is often to be creative, make more stuff, make more opportunities, have faith in your creative abilities, and you'll find new solutions to this age old problem. I always kind of make some more money just putting new stuff up for sale. So, so I tend to, in that case, uh, make some drawings on paper and then sell them. And I can, I can also uh, start a new book project. So I always have other things that I can do before really going out out there and, and really try to, to get commission work. And I, at this stage, I've been lucky. That it's, it's, a, it's a trickle of commission work all the time. You read a lot about other artists, uh, or maybe like music groups, and suddenly they they lose their creativity, or or they're not in vogue in, with the time. So it's always, it's a, it's a, on some levels, it's always a, a worry about the future. It's part of living as well, not being super secure. Me thinking about having work to do is a big part of my brain. And at points it has been sort of negative where I'm overly concerned that I will not ever get to work again. And it has affected my work and my life. But I, I have been sort of lucky that it's been so steady long enough that it, it seems like it'll kind of keep doing that. But in at the same time, you know, I'll still shoot out emails sometimes and I still do a lot of self-promotion. With time, with hard work, comes a growing business. After years of just getting by or having to supplement your creative career with odd jobs in a coffee shop or working for the man, you slowly start to feel your feet under you. You learn the rhythms of the work. You expand and deepen your network. You learn not to panic when the phone doesn't ring. And eventually, you feel like it's all going to work out. Do I feel secure? Yes. The security is more important than anything else, security for my children, because I am a single parent. And it was a tremendous amount of stress. So it's only been probably in the last six months that I felt this is fine. You, you can have permission to relax, take your foot off the pedal. I was dreadfully sick at the beginning of this year. And I think that was another wake up call to say, you, you, you're burning out. This is a signal from whoever, you're absolutely fine. There is no need for you to keep going at the pace that you're going because you're actually in a safe place. When I started uh, doing illustration, it was like a jump into the, the really unsecure because I had a, a steady job and a, everything was going right. But suddenly my body just, told me no you can't continue with this and somehow it has been working and uh, I should probably not worry that much but it's I think I, I, I'm probably 
the worrying kind. So I started on this journey probably four and a half years ago, and it's taken me four years to get to a place where I feel like I can hold my head up high and look at my achievements and give myself a pat on the back. I was very critical uh, until very recently of where I thought I was at. And it's only now that I can actually sit back and say, you've actually accomplished so much and you've got so much to be proud of. If you're thinking of taking the leap into being a full-time artist, I hope this discussion has been helpful. Despite the struggles and hard work, none of my friends regret taking the leap into being full-time artists. Living your dream is wonderful, but dream with open eyes. Being creative doesn't mean being incompetent at business, clueless at numbers, terrified of spreadsheets, unable to sell successfully. If you can do all the hard work it takes to be great at drawing and painting, chances are you can figure out how to create a reasonable business plan too. Don't sell yourself short. Save money when opportunities are abundant. Be prepared to compromise, but don't sell yourself out. Get help and support, but remember, it's up to you in the long run. There is no cavalry coming up with a truckload of assignments. Building a career is a long journey, and you need to be prepared. But don't wait to figure it all out. You can't prepare yourself for all of life's vicissitudes. The road twists and turns, and you won't see clearly around each bend. You need to just trust your own creative abilities to know that you can develop solutions to whatever comes up if you're willing to be flexible and imaginative. Thanks for joining me again for another episode of Art for All. And thanks to all the faculty of Sketchbook School. They're all so inspiring and generous with their time and their energy and their ideas. If you've never experienced a class with them, I urge you to start today. And if you think you'd like to learn more about the world of being a professional illustrator, I'd recommend joining our class called Illustration Nation. It's a month-long course that takes you step-by-step through the process that a professional takes to create a book or a product or an illustration. If you'd like to see what it's like to work hard on a single polished assignment from concept to production, you'll get a huge amount out of spending time with our faculty of 10 different experienced professional illustrators from around the world. You can start anytime, work at your own pace, and have lifelong access to this wonderful material. Learn more at sketchbook.school. I'm Danny Gregory. See you again next week for another episode of Art for All. Another episode of Art for All, brought to you by Sketchbook School.